Mm-hmm. Facebook seems yeah, to like that. A lot of people if I just get to work. And we are live with episode 110 of the Start, Build, Grow show. Randy Brothers, my friend, what is going on? How are we doing? Back in studio, my man, with another epic guest. Pretty epic stoked guest. about yes. tonight, today. So for those of you listening to your car on the podcast, uh, thank you for all your love and support of the show. 110 episodes in. Mm-hmm. If you're just now being exposed, uh, make sure to like and subscribe. If you're watching live on Facebook, hit the subscribe mm-hmm. button, the like button. If you're listening on any one of the podcasting platforms, make sure to subscribe to the show. Yep. We have a lot more shows scheduled and coming at you in the near future. And uh, we're stoked to uh, have good audio back, being back in studio, mm-hmm. and uh, and getting a, a really awesome show on of one of one of our favorite topics that we've ever had. One of my personal favorite topics mm-hmm. because in roofing, it seems like. Every contractor just has this this perception of, hey, man, I got to get into commercial, mm-hmm. right? We all want to get into commercial. I want to dive into commercial until we fall flat on our face. Mm-hmm. And that happens. And it happened to me. I've been there, done that. Many of us have many <laughs> stories. I'm sure my man Jonathan has many a stories. So uh, you may know this guy. I don't even know if he needs an introduction. Jonathan yeah. Sherwood, you've seen him on Facebook. He is, you know, one of the most, you know, uh, uh, recognized uh, commercial specialist in our industry. You see, you see his posts and his videos all the time, and he crushes the insurance, uh, crush in the, the commercial roofing sales game. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're really pleasure to have you on, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you guys. I appreciate you inviting me on the show and mm-hmm. 110 episodes. Uh, mm-hmm. Congratulations. Uh, I was watching some of these back when you were in the single digits and look at it now. Now I'm sitting here with you and then finally getting together after the COVID and the Rona, mm-hmm. man. I mean, we're all, it's kind of nice just to be around other folks and not be on Zoom. You yeah. know, where you, where you got a shirt on and no pants. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, in your days, I, I, sweats. Yeah. You're lucky. I changed for you, bro. I, I yeah. took my sweats off, put my shorts <laughs> on in order to, to, to be presentable today. Yeah. Well, here. So first off, we got Nathan Ellis. He's always hopping on saying what's up. He says, what's up? Good to see you, Jonathan Sherwood. So he's saying what's up, man. Looks like we got some people tuning in for Jonathan already. So we like to always start, you know, with the background, man. Let's start with the story, right? So how did you kind of get in the roofing space? What's your background? Yeah, uh, a little bit of a crazy background story. I kind of make it short. And, you know, I unfortunately was a lot of poor decision making when I was younger. It was actually... uh, involved in a lot of organized crime uh unfortunately okay and uh ended up getting strung out on illicit narcotics and was looking for kind of a way out of everything was on a road to prison or death and a buddy of mine you know he spoke to me and this was i don't know 13 years ago or so and he's like hey when you're when you're sober you're one of the best salesmen in shoe leather that i know let's get you sober and let's open a roofing company. I'm thinking roofing. I'm like, I sell cocaine. I don't know. (laughs) roofing. I'm like, what what are we going to do here? And in that journey, you know, I ended up becoming a Christian and and, and getting sober and seeing that roofing could be extremely lucrative. And I remember, you know, knocking some doors out in Sterling, Colorado on an old storm uh, that happened, I think three years prior and just churning up some resources on that old storm and then turning that into seven figures and then pouring that back into the company. And, uh, letting that thing grow and really brand. And then we were fortunate enough to sell it to the regional operations manager of uh, John Mansville in uh, September, 2016. And during that time, I was already going back and forth between DFW and Denver and doing a lot in the commercial market in both places. Uh, More heavily residential was our company here, but we were also dabbling in the commercial market on some strip malls and different things and growing over there in Dallas to vice president to president and really growing this, uh company that i was working with and then i was like you know i'm doing so much here i need to go ahead and brand myself and brand it with the niche that i'm doing and really use uh you know social media and the platform uh to kind of propel me out there in the industry to help other contractors and that's kind of when came up with the roofing specialists and the roofers helping roofers that's just you know exploded uh across the nation you know there's some predominant territories but i mean i get everything from calls from new york florida all the way you know to california uh, I tend to work this stuff and mobilize, you know, that's going to work for my niche and as far as distance. But I mean, now it's just exploding. It's all over the place and uh, everybody's kind of gaining from it. And the whole thing was to cultivate relationships that bring value to both parties. And sometimes it had nothing to do with monetary gain. It was just actually helping out other roofers, passing along different things, yeah. maybe helping them with personal stuff, helping them in recovery, things like that. And it just kind of flourished into you know what it is today. Awesome. You're in the right place, man. This is uh, kind of the premise for this show. It's all about 
you know, sharing the entrepreneurial journey, but helping providing resources to educate uh, contractors out there, man, mm -hmm. no matter where you are in, in your journey, just getting started, trying to break five, 10, 20, whatever the, the, the next benchmark you're in, we want to provide resources and, and help people get to that next level uh, through the podcast and through all of the, all the stuff that we put out on social media too. So let's talk about social media for a minute. I sure. mean, mm -hmm. what's, uh, you know, how, how did you kind of get going in that? How did that become a thing? And what's been some of the, some of the results and, and, you know, talks to the people out there and how important yeah. the social media aspect of building a business. Is. It's a great question. And I get it all the time. Oh, I yeah. actually <laughs> love answering it. Cause it, it I figured it, as much, you're it, ready for this. It, one. It, it's been a lot of fun too doing it because I didn't know anything about it for one. And I still don't think I know a whole lot about it, but I've got people that I work with with me that know quite a bit about it, but how it actually started is I've been doing what everybody's seeing me do for years now. It just, I had no social media platform, mm -hmm. no Instagram, no Facebook, and anything whatsoever. Well, I went to win the storm when they had Gary V speaking mm -hmm. and he talked about how, you know, under the sound of my voice, there's going to be one person in here that grasps this and there may have been a couple, but there's going to be like one single digit person here that grasps is actually going to do what I say, document what you're doing. Don't try to sell stuff, be consistent. And I was like, you know what? That's going to be my takeaway from this. Every time I go somewhere, I'm like, what's my major takeaway? Yep. So that's what I'm going to do. So I ended up connecting with uh, my videographer, who we're friends. Uh, we met in uh, the youth ministry in South Dallas, uh, both as volunteers, and sat down with him. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to bring you on, and we're going to just be consistent with it. And I really didn't know what I was getting into because I'm thinking, you know, all right, I got to get people to stop scrolling. How do I capture this audience? Yeah, capture that one, two seconds of attention. Yeah, and I'm like... And on top of that, I never even had a Facebook before, so I never even captured an audience. So I didn't even know how to use Facebook at the same time or any of the other platforms. So I'm like, okay, how do we do this? We're like, okay, let's document. So we just started documenting, just giving all the knowledge and value away, mm -hmm. just giving it away. Like, here's what I'm doing. Here's how I'm gleaning clients. Here's how, what I'm doing with this specific project. Here's how I stay consistent, stay busy. And we just documented everything. And then we stayed consistent. And then we started evaluating it because what you think is going to get folks to stop scrolling and catch your audience most of the time it's not so you'll make this great video and you're like oh i'm gonna get several thousand organic likes on linkedin and the phone's gonna ring and you'll put it out and it'll be like 161 and you're like nobody likes me and then you'll go and i'll, I'll grab a plastic monkey name him spoony love and do the stupidest thing you can think of and 5,000 people think it's the greatest thing ever and they want to dm me and talk about hey can you meet me for lunch and i'm like because i said a monkey gets on roofs without a ladder and doesn't need eagle view for measurements just being just being a clown so you start seeing what what captures the audience and then you'll be able to maneuver it mm -hmm. to kind of propel you where you want to go the other thing is you can't have the same stuff all the time that's why you'll see me doing either you know chops from podcasts like this yeah. Mm -hmm. or you'll see me on roofs doing inspections or you'll see me teaching classes or you'll just see me mm -hmm. what i do when i'm not working or you'll see me with my industry peers and i mix it up a lot so it doesn't get dry mm -hmm. yep and yep. so that that's been that way but i would say consistency and be ready to spend some dollars. Mm -hmm. yep. And the biggest thing was I didn't see anything for about eight months. Yep. No, nothing monetary, no gain from it, really. Just kind of getting the momentum going. But it's just like once it actually hit that time and it started going, it just grew from there. And then you'll get points that get like a little plateau, almost like working out. And you get a little bummed or you're dieting. You know, you're doing great. You're getting lean. And they're like, <laughs> I can't get any more pounds off. What happened? Yep. Same thing with your, your media. It'll kind of happen. You're like, okay, how do I change it up a little bit? What can I do different? Yeah, yep. I, I kind of go through cycles, you know, I'll be pretty heavy and then I'll just take a little break. I'll be pretty heavy and take a little break. Maybe that's not the right way to do it, but for personally, yeah, you know, at some point you just like, all right, I just need to focus on me, focus on family, kind of do my thing and just, but still stay with something going. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you have a good team around you, you know, Nick over here uh, on the, on the keyboard, just crushing the production. I mean, his and him and his team do a lot of our social media posting, mm -hmm. which is great. So if you're, if you're really taking it serious, you want to have good, consistent, organic content, but find someone to help you with the process. Help yes. You mm -hmm. Maintain that consistency. Help you with with uh, with setting a set schedule and, and posting and and uh, creating that content. And yeah, it's investment. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's like this show. People think, oh yeah, just film in our basement. 110 episodes every Wednesday night, six to seven, <laughs> you know, the thousands of, I mean, this equipment is thousands of dollars of equipment, like hours and hours that this man puts in there, him and his team put in doing the oh, production yeah. and, 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 it, and, and it's, and, and it's, it, it, who knows, right? It's just like, let's just do this and see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and the same type of scenario, I mean, 110 episodes now, but now we'll get five, six, 7,000 views per episode. Yeah. But before it was like a couple hundred. 
Yeah. You know, or you get like a few people, three or four comments. We're like, share this. Come on, come on, somebody like this. Mm -hmm. And and the key, I think, is put out good content, man. Be genuine and put out good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that's it. Just kind of has kind of manifested itself ever since then mm -hmm. to, to grow to where it is now. One, one thing I want to add in that too, I think the big thing that we do, and I know is that you do too, is collaboration too. Mm -hmm. So when you bring on someone else that's in the space too, that collaborative marketing is big because then they share it in their networks and everything like that. So now you're sharing networks to distribute that content. Yeah. I think that's a big thing. Uh, so we had a few people that were chiming in saying, what up? Uh, we had Mike G in Philadelphia with BMG Exterior Innovation saying, uh, good evening, gentlemen. We got Matt Collins saying, uh, what's up, guys? Matt. Ted Webb saying, what's up, guys? Looks like Matt Collins is busy, but awesome. So that's good. We got Armando Jaycox. What up, dudes? He's still at the office grinding Speaking away. Speaking of content, my yeah. man Armando's putting out some stuff. Check yeah, he's his, starting out the YouTube there, channel. You go, brother. Yeah. I, I, Check out Armando's mm -hmm. YouTube page. Yeah. So check out Armando J. Yeah. Cox. Uh, just did an F Wave one. Yeah. Just putting out some yeah. good YouTube content. So d definitely check him out. He's been on the show before, and uh, we may or may not have a little little plan in place to yeah. put out some sweet stuff for you guys. And we got we got uh, Gene Rich too. So we got he is great. Best ever, Jonathan is always 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 willing to help. Uh, Sam Roof guy. Funny how that works. The post you least expected get engagement popped off. So true. So. Okay, so now let's dive into the commercial side. We talked a little bit about this upstairs, right? Hey, everyone thinks commercial is the sweetest deal ever, right? Mm -hmm. well, if, you, if people are trying to break into commercial, what suggestions or tips do you have for them to get going and to make sure they have some realistic expectation of what's going to take to be successful in the space? Yeah, and that's another question I get all the time. Yep. And uh, I mean, the, the number one thing folks always say, well, how do I get in commercial? Create the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Get on the roofs. If you can get on the commercial roofs and the commercial opportunities, and then you can go ahead and correspond with guys like myself or other guys in the industry or guys like you that have some background in that and get a little help with it. You can make something out of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I always like to tell them, you know, because most of those gentlemen are usually doing residential mm -hmm. and dabbling a little bit in the commercial, maybe 80, 20, 90, 10 or trying to look over. But that residential is good cash flow to help propel them into that commercial, because in that commercial, you always hear me say, hurry up and wait. Yeah, there's no overnight it's a long coming. sales cycle. Man. Yeah, there's no is. overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had things that take three years, 18 months and every once in a while you get a home run, you go meet somebody and then you get to do their roof. But majority of the time, you know, when they're spending that kind of ticket, it takes a little while. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I take it from another avenue is what they have to spend, because you have to look at it as like you're going to have to spend some resources to get into the commercial market. So, you know, if you're with minimal resources and they always tell me, how do I get those opportunities, Jonathan? I'm like, well, you know, you can always do some telemarketing leads, do your research on them and go that that route. I usually say that telemarketing leads tend to be the best directly after a storm. Yeah. Uh, there's also networking and then, you know, time is money. So don't burn your money. So you don't want to go to a bunch of networking events where guys are just having cocktails, getting smashed at the bar. Find where stuff where maybe like your uh, your business HOA companies and managers and property managers are going to maybe get in BNI groups in a good chapter in a good area and take it real serious and just stay consistent with it. But it's consistency, all in, seeing what type of money you have to manage and then moving that money around very strategically. You know, if you have money for business development gals, I think they can be one of the best things you can ever hire. If you got somebody out there that can get you to the closing table, get you to the decision makers, I call them rainmakers. You know, if they can go to the tournaments or they can go to the trade shows or they can go to the different events and draw up and begin to cultivate those relationships to get you at the table with those guys so you can turn those into a raving fan where all they do is use you. Uh, mm -hmm. You have, like mm -hmm. I said before, the purchasing elites. Uh, then you have like lots of different sponsorships, you know, you can sponsor different uh, like multifamily syndicate bus tours or you can sponsor different events for property management. Golf companies. tournaments. Golf tournaments mm -hmm. are great. Uh, so you have events. Uh, so we did, you know, purchasing leads, rainmakers, events, networking, whether it's mm -hmm. on your own or other people in your office. And then you can take your residential database and you're going to have commercial opportunities that come from that residential database. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can work those referral program as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there's I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's some it's it's uh, <clears throat> I've heard in the past. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Steve. So, you know, Steve Patrick mm -hmm. and watch one. I was, did, I've done some speaking with him at different engagements. And one of the things is like, man, this is, I'm going to blow your minds right now. Mm -hmm. You have a whole bunch of residential people. What's the chance that they actually work somewhere? <laughs> Ask them if they, who they yeah. work for and where they work. Is there roofing opportunities there? What mm -hmm. do you know? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and little things like that. So tapping into that database is, is uh, definitely a good, uh, 
good opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put Nick on over here because Nick's been working on some things with a number of contractors developing mm -hmm. commercial relationships. And, and they developed a system where they were they're able to really leverage LinkedIn for a lot of opportunities. I know we're getting a lot out of that, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to throw Nick under there. What mm -hmm. you got for... I mean, dad, dad is everything nowadays, right? So with LinkedIn, if you, if you connect with somebody, you automatically have access to their contact information. So about, you know, 95% of them will have an email, 50, 55% of them will have a phone number. So if you have some kind of automation tool that is able to connect with these people in your target market, you know, in your, in your geographic area, uh, that can be, make a difference for you on the commercial side of things, you can grab that info, right? From there, you can do a variety of things. You can do email funnels, email drips, text message campaigns, voicemail drops. But at the end of the day, data is king right now, right? So get the data and then use it appropriately to create those opportunities, 100%. Now, what what do you think um, is some of the biggest mistakes you're seeing these commercial guys getting in the very beginning that they can maybe solve if they listen to you right now? So I, I live by three components. And then I have another thing that I say all the time. So one is, know your client, mm -hmm. know your craft and set expectations. Mm -hmm. If you do those three things, which we'll get into that a little more detail. And then you do this last one, slow down. You mm -hmm. will do good in commercial. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to know your client. I ask folks all the time, whether I'm working with a roofing contractor or if I'm working with a building owner or a board, I say, what are you looking for in the contractor you're going to hire for this project? So I know right off the bat, what are these individuals really looking for to hire me? not necessarily price or scope or anything. What are you looking for? Cause then it'll begin to come out. Cause then I can dial into what mm -hmm. it is they're actually looking for. Yep. So you want to know your client. The other thing is you want to know your craft. Mm -hmm. If you're selling single ply or shingles or fluids, you better know what you're selling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. So, so I'd recommend mm -hmm. going out to either your job sites or other folks, job sites in the industry or getting connected with other roofers that are good in that niche and saying, Hey, let me see this installed. Hey, maybe they'll let you get behind the gun and code a little bit. Maybe you can do a little bit with the welder, some of the care classes for GAF, but know your craft, know what you're selling yep. where you can actually have a discussion with it and just not be a slick salesman. Mm -hmm. and training. Then, I mean, every man, every manufacturer out there has, has training operations. Mm -hmm. uh, so get in touch with them. Uh, suppliers have training mm -hmm. and locally here we have, you know, the CRA is one of the best roofing associations in the country mm -hmm. and, and they have a, their own training facility and now all winter long they do training. Yep. So they do metal training, they do single ply training, they do, you know, uh, steep slope training, all the different types of things, you know, talking about, uh, you know, flashings and all these things. So they have all these different training courses. We send almost everybody in our company to those trainings. Yep. I'll even have like my admin go to a roofing course. Yep. To learn about roofing like everybody should know at least enough to be dangerous about roofing to answer mm -hmm. a couple of questions to know what flashing is to mm -hmm. know what you know strip edge is and some of the basic components so everyone in our company knows those things i 100 percent agree you know i tell folks all the time usually when i'm teaching class say hey before you ask me where can you go find it contact your distributor mm -hmm. have a partnership with them they handle your materials. They want you to know what type of materials that you're installing, applying, et cetera. Get with them and they will get you into probably some free training pretty quick. And oh, then yeah. you can go ahead and pour dollars in where you think there's routes that you're going to go. Mm -hmm. And the last one there is, you know, set the expectation. That is huge in commercial. Mm -hmm. Let's just take, you know, a low slope system with a restoration, for example. Okay, if we have a failing system and we're getting ready to power wash it to promote good adhesion, probably a good idea to tell them that when I spray this roof, it's going to leak, even though there's no, no rain in the forecast test forecast because when yep. it just starts coming down mm -hmm. and i'm up there all that rapport that i built is going to go down the drain it's, it's amazing how you can it takes forever to gain it but it can go that quick so yeah. set an expectation timeline expectation timeline mm -hmm. expectation how long the production is going to take what to expect what kind of damages could occur if there's something unforeseen how we're going to handle it you know consistent communication with the guys and the client i think those are huge and then like the last one i said that i just see so many people go so hard and fast you know we're, we're not putting on residential roofs slow down Mm -hmm. slow down yep you know don't try to force anything you know we see weather and we have a, a break for a day and a half and we see 35 40 squares we put it on you see weather in commercial back up slow yeah. down that's yeah. it that's one good thing but just and, and everything take it like the bids are a good one i have a lot of roofers that'll come to me and they'll say hey can i get that bid from you tomorrow and i'm like absolutely not yeah. like, we're talking several hundred thousand yeah, exactly. dollars if i yeah. mess no, up not gonna happen this is this is gonna we're both going to struggle. So I'm <laughs> it's saying, a couple T joints. Yeah. You're like, what the? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tell them. Bucks. Yeah, I tell them. I say, tell your clients, I'll get this turned around into five to seven business days. Explain to them that you got to get a comprehensive, dialed in scope of work. 
in a cost breakdown form, why it's going to take them a little while. You'll mm-hmm. add some material data sheets, you'll add SAPL warranties, and, and, and that's the same expectation explained to them. And I've had so many commercial clients who say, well, we need that yesterday. And I tell them, and then they're fine, five to seven, and then I don't do it for 18 months, 10 months, six months. Everybody mm-hmm. wants a bid yesterday until they see the yeah. sale price. Mm. Oh yeah, <laughs> and then it's like, whoa! I didn't know. A roof Wait is a minute, six hundred grand. Let me let me up my dues to the HOA. <laughs> yeah. to all my people. To now I got to get the money. Yeah, so I got to get the money. A lot of times they'll press guys just getting into it, but just know you can be very transparent and get that time that you need mm-hmm. to slow down. Well, there's nothing like I mean, a big mistake that I've experienced personally, and I've seen a lot is is when you rush, you get into this job, you want to get this job going, and you don't have all your ducks in a row, you don't have your scope proper Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're off by a couple things and that just snowballs into thousands of dollars that you're off you made a mistake you know and you're and you're you're eating that cost as you're building this roof out because you didn't take more time up front to plan and prep and and get the thing right right Mm -hmm. and and another thing too is labor right Mm -hmm. early on and unfortunately this is kind of what it is and why you want to work with a guy like jonathan because you know uh, there's a lot of you know, uh, turnkey and or commercial, you know, labor outfits out there Mm -hmm. that you're a brand new roofer, you've never done a commercial before and you come up to them, they know right away that you have no experience. Next thing you know, you're paying a premium for them. There's no, there's nothing left for you. Mm -hmm. And you try to get this job and and then, and then you, you, and you try to put a little, you know, a little something on there for you. You don't, you never get the job because you completely have this. So you got to really have good labor relationships, trust your labor, know that they're, 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 they got your best interest and really do a good job vetting the, the, the labor that you're going to do. So if you just take the first guy that's that's available just because you want to get this job done, be aware that you could run into some challenges and you can end up doing a big job and make no money. Mm-hmm. Or you can push yourself right out of the deal. Yep. Because in retail and in commercial, well, let's just you know be upfront about it. Even if they get a claim on something huge, they purchase those buildings as an investment. So I see a lot of guys, especially in Texas, so I can't say necessarily Colorado, but they'll get these strip malls or these giant buildings. They'll get the claim and then they want a retail price and they just pray for that hail to make money off their building. Doesn't mean it's okay, but it's the reality of what's going on. And it's not their first rodeo. They know what that costs within mm-hmm. give or take 10, 15 cents a square foot. You can put, you could have the greatest 10 page proposal and a video to back it and push yourself right out the game. And I could come out there with a couple pages and knock it out real quick. So you got to make sure, you know, you're not out of budget and you're within that market's retail pricing. So when you're looking for guys to work with that are turnkey, make sure they're quantifying and they're doing a lot of work and go get your boots on one of their roofs and talk to people that have used them and make mm-hmm. sure they're direct with manufacturers and they you know their, their guys are in-house and just kind of vet them, like you said, vet them a little bit, really dial in and check the temperature on the guys you're using. And that's a great, great thing to think about for residential too. Mm-hmm. I mean, residential crews, like vet your crews. Don't just hire a crew that has that talks well and says they have all this stuff. And here's a couple of pictures. OK, here's 10 roofs. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, they did 10 roofs for you. And you look back. Oh, crap. They forgot this, this, this and this because they don't know our local codes or they just, mm-hmm. you know, they, their turnover inside their own crew is just ridiculous. No, the, the crew chief's never even on the job side. They're drinking at the, you know, there's so many things that can happen out there if you're not properly vetting crews across the board. A lot of us use subcontract labor. It is what it is. It's, it is what the market is. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you can't still have quality. Mm-hmm. Have quality control in place in house to be able to hold them accountable, but do have a thorough process in place to vet your crews. And mm-hmm. you, you just hit the nail on the head. The the most sustainable roofing companies I see that are most say successful, quality control. Oh yeah, they have quality. They, we have a they, whole quality they, control. Name them all kinds of different names, but quality control management and having a process. Mm-hmm. If you have those two things, you're doing what's right. Yeah. So check this out. We're we're ramping up right now, right? Mm-hmm. Not only just because summertime you start to get more busy, but hail season's upon us. We should have hopefully some soon. Mm-hmm. And instead of kind of waiting for the hail and then just taking whatever crew calls us, we have this list that we've had for eight years. Like every every time a crew calls us, whether we have work for them or not, we'll take their information. We'll do an interview. We'll check with them. And then we, we weed through that list. We narrow it down to a handful of crews. And then we bring them in for a formal interview and then from there, we'll give them one roof. Mm-hmm. We'll quality control. We'll see how they do that one roof. And then we'll narrow it down again. And that's it's a, good it's a process. But soon as hail hits, we can go from here to here overnight and maintain quality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because we're putting the legwork in now to vet crews and have the crews ready. However, I'm going to interject here because this show would not be po- process, uh, possible <laughs> without our amazing sponsors. You talk about process, right? Anytime process comes up, you want to want to mention that you know the great people over at Job Nimbus. 
Mm-hmm. You know, awesome. JobNimbus.com has been a, been an amazing support for not only my company, for a ton of our, our viewers, our members, all the people I work with mm-hmm. in the academy. And we've built a, a, an amazing process. It's customizable. You want a good process for your commercial production, for your residential production, for your commercial service. I don't know about you, but that's three completely different processes mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. We have all of them built out in Job Nimbus. They follow three completely different workflows, supplementing process, completely different workflow, all of that built within Job Nimbus mm-hmm. and all the communication, all the data, all in one place. On top of that, they're networked and connected with a ton of over 30, 40 different integrations with other software. So if you're looking at improving the systems and processes in your business, first place you want to start is Job Nimbus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, what about what about uh, you know you probably experienced this right mm-hmm. you know you're you're trying to you're in a different market you're trying to figure out what you know especially in residential you're trying to figure out what what the specific code is for that project mm-hmm. how many times you run into headaches with that especially here yeah right so mm-hmm. our man Garrett Kurt who came up with a solution everyone said there's no way this guy can do this he actually had built a software where you can put in the address and get that code with a click of a button and it prints off a report that you can then take to the insurance company and it has clout and leverage to say, Hey, insurance company, this is the real code for this address. Here's my supplement. Here's my code report. Pay me. That's slick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's pretty slick. One click code.com. Uh, we've had him on a couple of times and they, they, they're blowing up overnight and it's awesome to be a partner with there. So we appreciate you guys. If you want to look into this all over the country, one click code.com. And of course the roof and Academy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we work with a number of different contractors all over the country from startup all the way to scalability, work with commercial, residential, service, the whole nine yards. But what I wanted to do, we haven't done this in a while, is uh, promote the book. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys know, a couple of years ago, we wrote a book, the Start to Build It, Grow It, which is kind of the premise for the show. Uh, it's 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 a guide for you know building a great, successful construction company. And I wanted to write a book, not only from experience, but with tangible, applicable things to really help you build and grow a great business. So if you haven't had a chance to check out our book or the book I wrote that went a bestseller in multiple countries. It's been a pretty cool journey. So if you haven't checked that out yet, uh, you can check it out on Amazon, uh, amazon.com. Just search out, uh, start, start it, build it, grow it. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. Well, absolutely. Thanks to the sponsors hundred percent. Otherwise it wouldn't be possible. Now I, I put the link to the book in the, in the notes as well, but we have four questions here. So we're going to try to run through these. Uh, so we got from Chris. So he's, he's wondering, you know, who should I be trying to get in front of in commercial? Is it mostly just the business building owners or who are some of the key decision makers I need to be getting in front of? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, right. Because first you have to figure out wh- who makes the decision. You know, you could, you could get with a, a building, you can get into a building, but that building might be owned by a group of people in New York an investment group. Mm -hmm. They may have a facilities manager with a certain amount of leverage or ability to make decisions. They may have a board. You may have to, you know, connect with somebody online to to connect with building owners all over the place, or you get into a building where the owner works right there and owns a building. Mm -hmm. The problem is you never know. You got to peel back the onion. You got to ask questions. You got to walk in. You got to start building that relationship and figure that out because there's no, I I don't know, correct me if wrong, but there's no, you know, easy way to answer that because there's so, every scenario is different that's the thing about commercial loaded question every <laughs> single, like seriously guys like i can't stress this enough and how frustrating it is we try to implement all these processes yeah. every single job is different there's something unique about every single job. yeah, mm. yeah. It, it's and, just crazy and every question in commercial is a loaded question because you hit it right if you got to give it one answer decision maker Mm-hmm. But where are you at also in your career? Are you able to knock out 50 buildings multifamily? Are you able to do strip malls? Are you able to do that stuff? Or are you just getting into it? If you're just getting into it, I tell folks, target churches, target mm-hmm. standalone smaller businesses with owner operators, dry cleaners, you know, laundry mats, small dental offices. Because a lot of times those smaller businesses, it might mm-hmm. only be 50 squares, 70 mm-hmm. squares, 100 squares, 150 squares, but there's an owner operator on site. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a lot easier as a smaller company or organization in the commercial side getting in and actually getting that work than if you go to, you know, 50 buildings and the multifamily investment group and they're going to vet you and all kinds of stuff. Like, oh, you've never done a job this big? Yeah, uh, no, I don't think so. And then so. you get into a market where you got to get bonded. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what <laughs> you know, are you, what's we, your capability? Yeah. We're ready to that where a small company gets, you know, a million dollar roofing company is like, oh, I got this opportunity. This $1.5 million job. Can you get bonded for that? No. You go, you go ask your insurance, you get a bond bonding agency like, no, good luck. <laughs> like, well, you've supplier. never done this before. Next thing you know, you if you somehow get into the deal, next thing you know, like it it, it could it could cripple you mm-hmm. financially. If you don't have the funds and the financial means to be able to get into a large project 
walk before you run. Slow that, down. That 50 to 100 squares is a great segue. I agree. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a great kind of niche market because I think from what I understand, the, every market has these big conglomerate commercial outfits, right? Mm-hmm. In-house labor, they're doing a ton of volume, thousands and thousands of squares. They're only looking for the large job that they can mm-hmm. put guys on and be on there for two months. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the schools, the malls, those sort of things. They see the 50, 50 square jobs like a headache, like, oh, I don't want to mess with that. Mm-hmm. So us small contractors out here wanting to try to you know get into the market with minimizing our risk, that's what we need to, I think, focus our attention. Mm-hmm. Not to mention the uh, fluid applied. Mm-hmm. Let's go there. Yeah, that's my favorite. My man. I know. I, I knew. See, you see, you see I, him I, spark I, I, up. I, 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 for for, for uh, those of you listening on the podcast, I'm sure you felt his smile. Yeah. 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 He just went all in. And, and I love it too. Like, yeah. we're doing more and more of this. And we might have to make a gif out of that or something. That smile, <laughs> right? like, <laughs> perks up. I mean, you, you can execute fast, you can solve homeowners or uh, building owners' problems, mm. you can put good warranties on them. It lasts a long time. Like, there, there's a lot of benefits to going that route and in providing that sort of opportunity for, you know, you mentioned the price. Everyone loves the idea until they get the price, right? Mm-hmm. They get that one and a half million dollar price or $150,000 budget price on, on, a, on a, you know, hundred square roof or something They're like, oh crap. Oh, or 60 grand, I can do it for, get you 10 year warranty on a, on a, on a, you know, flex coating. Mm-hmm. And you make more money. You can. <laughs> you depending on right. what position so you're how'd you get into coding like what, what's your what's your thought there you, for, for me it was i saw it as something that was up and coming and mm-hmm. i had always done a lot of stuff with just coatings but i think things really took off for me when i started really doing a lot with foam foam and coatings yeah because in my opinion coatings are great mm-hmm. but i like the foam to do the heavy lifting and i look at it like this and i always say this disclaimer before i get in this conversation i do not feel that foam or coatings are the solve all for every system. I think there is an efficient system for every single roof and the investment being made on that roof. Yeah. Now, I just like to use comparables when describing the fluids because it makes it easier. So what I like to look at is, you know, let's say we have a single ply job. Mm-hmm. So we got a single ply job, that single ply, we'll call it TPO, and that's a water shedding component. And it's usually built up, you know, maybe it's got a recovery board and some insulation. You got to, let's just say a deck. Well, what happens when that fails or it fractures, Mm -hmm. then, you know, we're going to get content damage beneath the roof system. So we got a water shedding component full of seams. Well, what happens if we foam a roof? We have a completely monolithic waterproof product Mm -hmm. that doesn't allow any content damage because it's a closed cell product. So if we were to get collateral damage as a building owner, instead of fracturing it and going down through the system beneath the roof line, it will stop because it's closed cell, no damage beneath the roof line, and we can get the same duration of the warranty on it. So for me, I hate liability and I hate warranty claims because that just, there's nothing like doing a good Jason job. Meeks. And here's the thing, when you're doing commercial mm-hmm. and let's just say you have a hundred thousand square feet, if you have a hundred thousand square foot job mm-hmm. and it had 30 leaks and we come through and finish it, and I don't care if you did single ply or if you did foam, there's a chance we're going to still bird dog two or three weeks after it's done. It's just that big, mm-hmm. which is fine because we bird dog and make the repairs and then it's water watertight again. But nobody's perfect. You know, even if it's a guy out there or a robot, they could get a cold well. Even if it's a guy foaming, he could miss something. Mm-hmm. So when you're doing stuff that big, you're usually going to have a few leaks. But when we have something like that, we get warranty claims mm-hmm. and they have content damage. It costs us more in that claim. So I tend to stay away from as much liability as possible and keep it as minimal as possible. And I've just found in low slope. On a lot of them, it's good to go with a monolithic product that's waterproof. It doesn't allow the content damage below. And then on top of that, for the customer's point of view, they can actually write that all off in one taxable year because it's considered a preventable maintenance approach. There's no municipality requirements when it comes to any type of R value or permitting. So it's just easier to mobilize on, uh, going to be a little bit more cost efficient with same duration of warranties. But with that being said, I love TPO. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'm getting ready. <laughs> to do some some more TPO here coming next week. And you you just saw me online. I was on 450,000 square feet of TPO. Yeah. And I just wrapped up another- You land an airplane on that roof. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, gonna wrap up another 2,500 squares of TPO. So I do a lot of single ply too, because there's times where that single ply is the best fit for that investment yep. and, that, and that situation. So I always like to say, fluids aren't everything. I just tend to like them a lot, but I use everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so we got some, we have a few more questions. I want to make sure we run through. We got two that are somewhat storm related. It says, uh, Gene says, you mentioned before retail versus storm. Is it, tr- is it truly harder to show storm damage in a non big storm market? 
You're the okay. world traveler. Okay, yeah, okay. What do you think? <laughs> okay, one more time. All right. So I think it, it's a proof of damage, right? Is, is kind of the question. Um, retail versus storm. Is it truly harder to show storm damage in a non-big storm market? So if it's really not, they're not used to having a lot of storms in their mm. area, is it harder to show proof of damage in those markets? I, I think storm's a storm. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you're dealing with legitimate textbook collateral damage, I don't do this gray area thing when mm -hmm. it comes to it's got collateral. Like, like, it, it really it really frustrates mm -hmm. me because it, 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 I don't want to get sidetracked, but the roofing industry has gotten a bad rap, and there's a lot of guys in this industry that are great people that want to do the right thing, yeah. and it's people doing illegitimate damage and going that route on top of some of the other crazy shit that we do mm -hmm. that get that rap for us. So I don't do the gray area. It's either got collateral damage or it doesn't have collateral damage. Mm -hmm. So if it has yeah. legitimate collateral damage and it has the fracture, it shouldn't be a hard case to mm -hmm. prove. Yep. If it doesn't have collateral damage, you're on your hands and knees trying to make a pea size oxidation turn into something and no soft metals have anything and nothing's fractured. Move on to the next mm -hmm. or, yeah. or take that and seize the opportunity, make that obstacle opportunity and sell them a maintenance contract. Somewhere yeah. between eight to 12 cents a square foot and prime yourself up for when they do get the storm damage. But here's mm -hmm. the thing, storm or not, every roof has to be either maintained, repaired, restored, or replaced at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At some point. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what you can do too, you get on that roof and, and you'd be surprised at how appreciative people are when you're just straight up with them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and, and it frustrates me because our guys like come to be like, I lost this job because I was straightforward and I told the homeowner that, hey, this is this is not going to be enough damage to, to file a claim. And some other roofer comes in and says, I'll get you the deal. I'll get this thing bought for you. Yeah. That's the worst. I'll get it bought for you. Mm -hmm. Really? You shouldn't have to get you it. You shouldn't bought. have yeah. to get anything bought. If, no. if it's damaged, it's damaged. If it's not, it's not. Be straightforward. Hold yourself accountable and and, and re respect this industry to, mm -hmm. to help, you know, for the longevity of all of our careers, right? Do things the right way. And you'd be amazed at how many people – we kind of pride ourselves, especially dealing with insurance agents, right? Yep. Or, or centers of influence on like commercial. You go in there and say, you know what? This is not a not a claim. We're gonna we'll we'll do a repair if you want, or do a maintenance mm -hmm. or whatever. That's fine. Uh, very minimal expense, but let's we're gonna go ahead and add you into our database, and we'll stay in touch mm -hmm. and uh, let us know the next time and, you have an issue. And that's a sustainable business, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because you can't just and, and look, we all like hail. Mm -hmm. We do, but we can't put it all on hail. You mm -hmm. got to be able to do storm damage retail and repairs to be in my opinion a roofing contractor mm -hmm. yeah. an all-around mm -hmm. roofing company yep. roofing contractor well, and ahead, and it's please. and that's exactly you know what we've done mm -hmm. internally i wanted I, I felt like early on in my career i was like you know i, I got into the hell game i was selling roofs knocking doors chasing around storms all the country and and then i went I, and i was a general contractor before that mm -hmm. so when i started my roofing division roofing you know brand of my company that's what I saw. I was like, I want to be a true roofing contractor. I want to be as good as I can at all things roofing, roofing, service, retail, mm -hmm. residential, coatings, flowers, all those things. And it took a long time to build all that out. And then all, and, and, and now that's that's led to the, the the coaching and academy. And people people see that like, OK, I want to figure that out, too. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily mm -hmm. what I do is like help contractors turn their business into a fully functioning business. It's in awesome. the roofing space and not just solely reliant on one thing that we're waiting on God, you know, mm -hmm. to, you know, you know, mother earth to, 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 to hail down on us. And, and so, that's not a sustainable business model. Agreed. So I got another question that's, that's kind of piggybacking on the storm thing. And then we'll kind of jump off the storm situation, but we got Camelon exteriors. Do you think it's easier to sell commercial deals in the storm setting? So I'm guessing during storm season uh, or all year round. And if you guys think it's all year round, what, what are you guys doing, you know, outside of the storm season then? I'm an all year round retail guy predominantly more mm -hmm. than I am anything else mm -hmm. uh, just because of my niche. I work with a lot of roofing contractors. So even if it is storm related, mm -hmm. they're out there. They're going to get the claim. I'm just coming in and taking care of it for them. And then I deal with a lot of large companies, whether it's multifamily groups or whether it's boards or mm -hmm. investment groups. And they know what things cost, like I said earlier, and they know what they're going to pay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once folks use me, they'll, they'll usually never use anybody else again. But what they do uh tend to do is get other bids just to make mm -hmm. sure it's within reasonable market all the time which yeah, i would be honest i would do the same thing there. shopping Absolutely. anything so for yeah. me i'm going to say i'm just predominantly a retail guy i might get what i call a home run a couple times a year where i get a claim but most of the time the way that i operate it's a retail business mm -hmm. for me. yeah mm -hmm. well the thing is you in a we're in a, we're in a store market right mm -hmm. you get into a store market you may be dealing, especially if you large loss, you get a PA, you get all these things, mm -hmm. these things involved. You may spend 18 months with dealing with an insurance claim before you even see set anything. foot on that job. 
Mm-hmm. Hurry up and win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that's exactly what it is. So you just got to understand that, you know, if this is not a small sales. Like if you want to break into commercial, understand that this is a multi-year process. You know, I started just early on, you know, the first couple of years, I'd get a, maybe one commercial deal a year. You know, mm-hmm. my first commercial deal, I went and knocked, I was, I was at a golf course and I went and asked for the manager and like, Hey, you got any leaks going on or got any issues with golf? Like, oh yeah, we're taking bids. Great. So I got in with them and figured out like work that. And, and that, that was great, but it, it just kind of happened randomly where I just mm-hmm. asked, started asking questions, essentially knocked the door and, and got my first kind of official commercial deal. Uh, but, but like you do a couple year, one a year or whatever, but yeah. when you're really going to focus on commercial, you got to understand it. It's, it's a monetary investment, it's a human capital investment, and it's a time investment. Mm-hmm. It's not just going to happen overnight. We've been investing in our commercial division for years now mm-hmm. to the point where we always have jobs going on. Mm-hmm. It took three, four years to get to that place where we have a pipeline where, okay, you got one job finished, another job's ready to go. One job finished, another job's ready to go. That is not going to happen overnight. It's not an easy process. Mm-hmm. Not so at all. Know, what it, know what it's going to take to actually do that. And if you get the random job, call a guy like Jonathan. That's what he does. That's what his niche is. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we got Dylan Wallace. Okay. So he's commercial contractor. What initial moves would you make for a contractor with a great established reputation but no online presence? What do you guys think? Uh, how are you passing that to us? Mr. No, well, hey, uh, I let you guys go Mr. and then I go. I, let, I, <laughs> I just ask the questions. Let's hear what you guys got to say and then I'll, I'll take in from there. Go ahead. I mean, first off, your, your website should be, should be mm-hmm. an additional sales tool. Mm-hmm. Your reputation. Google, those, are, those are the two right there. Google, right? Google mm-hmm. reviews, Facebook reviews, backed by a great website that's conversion-based that really shows the story of what you do. Videos. He videos every job. It creates a, creates content for that. Having that content case on your website, case studies, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, uh, referrals. Like, all, all this leads to referrals. Like People yeah. don't want to just call a roofer because they don't trust us. Mm-hmm. It's, sorry it is what it is yeah they don't trust us they want to see what we're capable of and they want to hear it from the people that we've worked with mm-hmm. however you can paint that message and and, and and display that and share that from multiple media outlets that's the way to do it in mm-hmm. my mind mm-hmm. yeah i agree and getting training on that like we said earlier so if you know nothing about online presence mm-hmm. there's workshops all the time contractor mm-hmm. dynamics does them i know some mm-hmm. of the distributors that'll have quick workshops that you can do go to a workshop get a little information mm-hmm. but like you said the easiest way to start out on it like we were talking about document mm-hmm. don't try don't go on there and say free roof inspections that drives me nuts mm-hmm. that drives me nuts mm-hmm. Do- bring value to whoever's watching document something mm-hmm. give away something that you're really good at you might have a special niece or something go out there film it Edit it, mm-hmm. get it out there, and let other people see what you did, and let them steal shamelessly from it as business. Mm-hmm. I mean, makes sense. In in the front end, I would say you know you get the website, you get the the, the five star reviews from anybody that you work for on Google, right? That make sure you have that on there. Video testimonials, for example, I was on your t- YouTube channel before this. You know, roofers are your technically your clientele. You have all these testimonials from them, mm-hmm. right? So make sure you have those, and then any kind of case studies where you have you know video footage of, of some of the projects you've done. Also, frequently asked questions. What are some of the most questions that that your customers ask you? Make a video library of that stuff. I feel like that would be a, a pretty solid start there. Um, let's see here. We have we got Mike G in the building. He says, "Could What's you up, Mike? Could you break into commercial simply by hiring an estimator to bid commercial work?" What do you guys think? No. Yeah, that sounds a little rough. I don't do a lot of estimator type work. So. It- <laughs> There's, I mean, that's such a, again, another one of them loaded questions again, right? Uh, when it comes to commercial estimating, if you're going to have a full-time in-house estimator, that's just an estimator sitting in front of a computer pumping out bids, mm. you, you got to understand the market because you're going after retail or, or new construction, mm-hmm. right? I, I, pref- I prefer to stay with new construction. I don't know if you- I, 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 don't, I don't touch I'll do any new construction. If that's your market, if you want to go to new construction, you really need to have a full infrastructure in place, quality control, in-house service techs, in-house- mm. Uh, labor in-house crews you want to have it really dialed in system in order to do that and then yes have an estimator reach out to there's public bids search public bids oh, yeah. you know there's a million mm-hmm. public can, bids out there right yourself. now you can bid all you Blue. want <laughs> you can bid 100 jobs and maybe land two of them but the, that's that's reality is you, you, uh, with that market with just hiring an estimator i think in our in our space you know we have the, we train and teach our project management team how to do their own estimates. Mm-hmm. They do their own prospecting. They, they can, they build these relationships, long-term relationships. And when they get the opportunity to bid a job, they're going to create the estimate themselves. Yeah. 
or if you get a really challenging situation, outsource it. There's plenty of people out there that can help you, you know, outsource large, you know, flat roof and, and large single pie bids. You know, we've used outsource companies to create mm -hmm. bids and take offs and that sort of thing for us, you know, but over the years, we've just, we feel like it should be a combination. The salesperson should be able to at least be somewhat dangerous with making making sure they have a good bid. So we just provide them a good tool to do that with. Mm -hmm. And I won't get too caught up on new construction, but I always like to tell the audience this. A lot of times, new construction, if you don't have an in or a relationship with somebody in the bid room mm -hmm. or somebody that's overseeing that, most of the time they use the same contractors all the time and they're getting bids to keep them honest. So unless you have an in and it's just an email coming to you that we all get every single day saying we have the opportunity to bid something, whether it's a school or this or that or government, they usually use the same people all the time. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody in the buyout room or the bid room and you have a relationship and that's an actual account, then it's great. But if you are going to bid those, just be ready to burn some money because the chances of getting any more than a couple of them are slim to none. And then a lot of times I've seen a lot of companies have a lot of struggle because they are, you know, net 60, net 180 on payout with oh, yeah. big GC. So you better have some capital because everybody else working on the job has got to get paid. Well, plus not to mention the, the thin margin you got to be at to yep. win the bid. Skinny. You're one of 20 contractors in there and you win the bid. Skinny. I'd be scared. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're probably the cheapest, which means you probably forgot something. Well, man, I know, I know you got a flight that's coming up here, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We definitely appreciate you coming to town, but when we always end it with a golden nuggets, so I make Randy go first and you get to go next is pretty much some kind of golden nugget that you want to leave contractors out there that you think could improve their business or help them in any sort of way, right? To kind of leave them with that insight. Now I make Randy go now first. And then after that, you'll, you'll close out the show, my friend. Thanks again for coming. <laughs> and I, I keep trying to come up with something unique, you know. Lots it's 110 of to, golden nuggets. To, yeah, 110 <laughs> golden nuggets, you know. I got a lot of content. I really work all this. <laughs> what are you supposed to do? You know, and, and I usually pick something off up off the conversation. Mm -hmm. And and I think the thing that stuck, stuck out with me earlier is, is patience. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> we all want to just go from zero to hero so fast that we skip steps. We want to take the path of least resistance. We want to just, you know, be, be go from zero to a million, $10 million overnight. And, and what I would say is be patient, be dedicated to the process, commit yourself to doing things the right way. Systems, processes, duplicated, repeatable, be a master of one thing and then add another mm -hmm. and then add another, then add That's another, good. you know, don't get too big, too fast. And don't be, you know, you know, what your, what my mom always say, you know, my, my eyes are bigger than my stomach. You know, mm -hmm. be careful. So be patient with, with your journey as an entrepreneur, no matter what you're doing. Be patient. Be true to what you believe in and uh, stay the course and always, always be learning. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm going to say my, my golden nugget from this episode and what I gathered the most from this conversation, what I admired the most kind of chatting with you guys is when you were talking about start it, build it, grow it and what you're doing to help companies that even become a real legitimate business, scale their business is you've changed your perspective to celebrate the wins and help others. And when we change our perspective to other people mm -hmm. and don't mm -hmm. focus on ourselves, we have the greatest wins. Mm -hmm. So oh, I man. think that's the nugget. If you can help celebrate other people's wins around you instead of being jealous, and if you can just, nothing to do with the roofing industry, just put the perspective on the other people, even when you're going through some of your toughest adversities, you'll just flourish as a man or a woman even better. And this is coming from a guy who failed his way to success. Mm -hmm. I made so many bad Likewise. decisions <laughs> yeah. that I'm just really good at what I do now. I just didn't end up good at it. I just <laughs> paid a lot of dumb tax. Dumb tax. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Keep, keep going here, right? That's a good book. All right, guys. Cool, thank you man. so much for joining us again. Subscribe, yes. like, uh, comments, and we'll be we'll keep the conversation Absolutely. going on Facebook. Absolutely. And Jonathan, thanks again once again for episode 110 for joining us, man. Appreciate it. Take care. God bless.